But everyone who's ever had an education, when you ask them to remember their education, they don't remember the course number, they don't remember the course, they don't remember usually the course content. They remember the person. This teacher or that teacher, or a fellow student, okay, who changed their lives, um, got them to think about something new, got them to think about themselves in a new way, etc. So this is something we know and is obvious. If you're in some kind of educational relationship with someone, the key ingredient is love. If fear, threats, intimidation come into play, they subvert any possibility of education. Any parent knows that to teach their kids, you have to love them, encourage them, support them, not terrorize them. I'd been invited to uh, help examine a, uh, a dissertation. The dissertation was a strong dissertation, uh, but I and, and the other examiners did the standard academic thing. and we gave the candidate a rigorous exam. David was there, and David stood up, and he basically took all of us examiners to task. And he said, why do you have to go through this? Why, didn't you, why don't you just tell this man that he's passed immediately, and then we'll just have a conversation about it? I'm still not sure if I 100% agree with David, but I do think that it was a very telling example of how David would break the rules in terms of defying what he saw as needless hierarchy and constraints on full human interaction. And of course, the other nice thing about David was that having made quite angrily this point about uh, breaking the rules, then afterwards we all went out, the examiners the student and David and had a beer and talked about it all. Now, I observed one of his undergraduate classes and I observed one of his graduate classes. You know, you get a sense of freedom. You get a sense of, I mean, every student that was, in the, that was sitting on a chair in that classroom was there because they wanted to be there and was involved in following what was going on with their minds and with their hearts and relating it to themselves. So that's what it was like. It's a very rich environment. Uh, I don't know, I guess we were pretty similar in the classroom. It was uh, total freedom and intellectual exploration uh, were, were sort of the guiding principles. He maybe tended to present his ideas and his analysis more. I tend to not do that and let the students discover things and be the ones who angrily insist on being told things, you know. I, I, le I let them feel the pang of not getting the usual delivery from a professor. But the undergrad courses, when the students are coming out of interest and they're there because they expect university to be freedom compared to high school those are still exciting uh, interactions. And when you accompany or see an undergraduate student um, discovering their own minds and their own freedom and their own thoughts and, and, and uh, discovering their rebellion to hold to that independence, that's very exciting. And that's what David and I thrived on, was, was seeing that that was still possible, even, even given the huge amount of institutionalization that these students had been subjected to. Professor Noble's first order of business on that first day of class was to inform the students that they could all have A's. Many thoughts were racing through my head. Is this a joke? How could he possibly give A's to all these other schleps when they surely don't deserve them? funny thing happened along the way. By the time we hit the halfway mark of the course, virtually all the students were highly engaged in the material and discussions each week. 
These are students who would have never otherwise been so engaged or thoughtful about their studies. They were no longer being processed. They were learning. For myself, it completely changed the way I approached my education. No longer was it about completing this or that course requirement, pleasing a professor, or filling another degree requirement. It was about learning. I was freed from the prison house of grading. I learned how to learn, not how to get good grades, which though no longer was consumed with concern for them, I still managed to do, incidentally. This issue of how much do we as teachers, what rights do we have to impose certain things on our students, like not giving grades, I think there's a potential in that uh, for us to, for them to make a change. Maybe that's one of the, the main um, contributions of that strategy, is that forces our students to make a change in the way they understand themselves as students. I think the uh, whole problem of grading is definitely kind of a pedagogical obstacle. On the other hand, um, it is the basis on which um, many of our students are able to gain access to, say, law schools or whatever, whatever. It becomes for them part of their uh, ability, a part of, of what they can bring in order to move their lives out into the world. And so I always felt that it was not in my hands. Uh, that I couldn't just arbitrarily myself decide to take that away from them. And whenever I talk to students about it, which over years I had done, I found many of them equally ambivalent about it. I'm paid for one purpose, to turn in the grades. In 35 years, I've taught in a number of institutions. No one has ever asked me what I teach and what happens in the classroom, because they couldn't care less. All they want is for me to turn in the grades at the end of the term. That's it. Now, fortunately, my collective bargaining agreement does not require me to specify, doesn't specify what those grades have to be, which is why I always gave all A's. And I explained that I gave all A's not because I want to give people A's, it's because I want to get rid of grades. I could give them all F's and achieve the same thing, but I would hurt a lot of people. But by giving everybody A's, it takes it off out of the equation. And then people say, well, that's not fair because some people are there and working really hard and they get, you know, the same thing as the person who leaves. That's not fair. If they both get the same thing. And I say, well, actually, they don't get the same thing because the first person gets an education. And they say, oh, yeah! We have to address how it is that grades are becoming such a currency and what underlies that and what else might be done to eliminate the necessity for grades.